this week's uh, septet of talking points. Right, here we go. I don't know, I don't know whether we'll be able to uh, stretch this first one to two minutes, but we might be able to. The closure of Maison Lafitte, Dave Yates, what, what does it tell us about the state of French racing, if anything? Uh, I don't think it tells us an awful lot that's positive about it. I think it, it raises in my mind two quite interesting issues. One is that uh, we're often, uh, we, we grow up, those of us who, who came to horse racing through betting, uh, we're told that the, the landscape in Britain is an unsatisfactory one and the, uh, the, the racing uh, countries in which there is a tote monopoly that racing is better served by this. Obviously, the, the corollary being that our situation, yeah. uh, we're serving shareholders rather than uh, racing itself. Um, I wonder to, to what extent that seems to sort of give the light to that that model of things. I think an interesting thing, I wonder how much money, uh, to, to what extent the closure of Maison Lafitte uh, is as a result of the millions that have been splashed on Longchamp, uh, which is very nice, but I think if you ask most French racing fans whether they would like two tracks, Maison Lafitte and Longchamp, or just one with a lovely mustard coloured grandstand, I think they'd probably go for the both. I would certainly, memo to the jockey club, prefer Kempton and Sandown <laughs> rather than Sandown that's gold-plated. And of course, one of your main owners, is is he still the chairman of Kempton, Nick He Westo? is, till the end of the year, yeah. he is, yeah. yeah. Oh, how sad would you be if Kempton went? I'd be very sad. I'd be very sad. I think it, it offers... Um, you know, as Ben was saying earlier, it offers the chance of better ground. It's a very fair track. It's a quick track, um, and uh, yeah, I, look, I'd be I'd be very sad to see that go. And I can't, I still can't understand why they can't develop the land at the far side and why it has to be all or nothing. Well, that leads us neatly on to our next topic because at the same time as we're talking about a closure of a race course in this country and a closure of a race course in France, we're introducing possibilities of new ways of, of running races and, and perhaps on streets in major cities around the world. City racing, the new concept devised by Andrews Byrne and by Peter Phillips and uh, John Spence Consulting and possibly the Jockey Club, seems to be gathering a little bit of steam. Does it appeal? If it attracts... Uh, interest and money to horse racing which then is diverted towards the bottom and the middle of the pyramid I'm absolutely all for it if it's just an exercise in if I can use the phrase willy waving from a, a load of rich men then frankly not I, I, my cons one of my concerns with city racing and the championship racing horse racing ideas is the whip I, I will not support any venture whereby we, we where, whereby we, we don't. I'm sorry to be bored. Don't oh, you're not a bore. I'm um, smiling. Whereby we, we do not mount a uh, a, a confident defence of the use of the whip for a horse not stopping at the end of the race. If it's just going to say, oh, don't worry, people, we don't hit the horses with them, we just use them for safety purposes, I can't support it. It's right on the, it's right on the spirit of the age, though, isn't it, Emma? If you're going to start something new, this is the way you're going to get into it, and this is where you're going to be winning hearts and minds with people in, in, in authority. I think it's right, and look, I, I hear absolutely what Dave is saying, but I think going forward... Um, public perception times have changed I'm afraid and um, and I think that the the days of the whip whatever we think are numbered and on a new concept like this I can understand why they're trying to get you know garner public appreciation to a wider audience and whether we like it or not I think that is the route that it is going to finish up going and you only have to listen to um, the debate in Parliament it, it just it's one of those emotive subjects that if, if you know, it's a cross-party thing and if they can win votes on something as, 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 as simple as that, they will. I'm going to break the bell rule for a second because I haven't brought Mikey in on this and you were nodding away and it would be very unfair of me not to let you have your say. Yeah, I just think the ongoing commercial success of horse racing in the public domain is just absolutely so important, isn't it? And imagine the excitement of having a horse race in a street so, you know, you go out and speak to anyone out in the street today, it's really hard for them to capture 
how exciting horse racing actually is. But if they've seen a horse galloping past them, past some traffic lights and whatnot, it's just an incredible thing to see. And you would really delve into a whole new audience, and you would undoubtedly spark new interest, bring in new money, as Dave says. Um, and I think it would be really, really positive going forward. And, and with the whip thing, I think that's, that, that's a tricky one, but you can't, you can't sell the whip to the public who don't know anything about racing at this stage. Go on, I'll let you have one more go. Let me just say... Well, I'll let you have that, one more go. That this idea that there is... Uh, a whole queue of customers waiting to come into racing the moment that the whip is not used as a means of not of of, uh, of encouraging whatever the the word you want to use uh, a horse to give its best to the line i think is is a, a, a cloud cuckoo land i would i would maintain that racing financially would lose because fewer people who are serious about horse racing will bet on it and this this mythical audience that exists that's just queuing waiting to come in the moment the whip goes is a load of nonsense i don't get invited to many dinner parties you'll be surprised to know <laughs> but when you talk to people People, and they say, what do you do? And I say, I write about horse racing. Not one person ever says, like, somebody says, oh yeah, I like the, never heard of you, but I like horse racing. Okay. Other people say, oh, I think that's boring. Load of men in brown trilbies, not for me, thank you very much. Nobody ever says, oh what, they, they hit horses with whips. It just doesn't happen. Um, dinner parties are not the only thing you haven't been invited to as we talk about um, anti-doping and the BHA strengthening up and tightening up their anti-doping policy. Before I come to you, Dave, though, Emma, it's got to be a good thing that, uh, that the BHA are, are tightening up, uh, intending to, to test every single winner of every race. It, just, it enhances people's uh, view of the sport in, in terms of its own self-policing and integrity. Uh, absolutely, at all levels, be it a punter, trainers, owners, you know, everyone wants to know that we're all play on, a, on a level playing field. Um, so, so I can't see any issue. I can only see that as, as, as being a positive and, and making racing as transparent as it possibly can be. Yes, it's a positive, but, and there is a but here, the shambolic way in which the BHA went about this by inviting four newspapers, the Times, the Guardian, the Daily Telegraph and the Racing Post, excluding everybody else and then feeding them this line. Martin Fuel, Director of I like Media what, what, what and was, what was uh, the line, the, the line about beefing up. Yeah. Uh, and I, I believe that there was the promise of a few more uh, stories to come, that there was some chat on the record and some chat off it. Martin Fuel, Director of Media and Communications at the BHA, formerly of Channel 4, formerly of the old Bill, uh, the Essex uh, Police. If that is the way you do your business, then please go back to the old Bill because it might work in the police force where you have the odd snout that you give a bit of information uh, to and you ignore everybody else. What we expect from horse racing's regulator, be we jockeys, owners, trainers or the media, is even-handedness. If this is a model for the future, then please just go. Might these not have been a collection of journalists who were, had shown a particular interest in this subject and therefore was Well, we've place. all got interest in integrity and security. Our, our livelihoods uh, depend on punters being able to believe what they see, because, or, or indeed owners being able to believe uh, what they see. I, I, uh, it was absolutely shambolic, and I, I, if, if this happens again, there will be trouble. Uh, there has been trouble this week for trainer John Butler, who's had his licence suspended for three months following a disciplinary hearing, which found he misled officials relating to injuries sustained by a horse in his care. A uh, hearing involved around the withdrawal of national anthem before a novice stakes at Redka last month on veterinary advice. Uh, Three-month ban on the face of it for misleading the BHA doesn't seem too harsh, but relative to some of the bans that have been uh, given out, it does seem quite stringent. It's, it's all about relativity, isn't it, Emma? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I haven't really followed the case to know exactly what it's what it's all all about. But you know, it seems if it's if it's a serious offence, then then it seems a very lenient one. If it's not, then it seems pretty harsh to be doing anything like that. But without really knowing the ins and outs of it, it's it's a difficult one for me to comment on anyway. I see what you mean. I, I get what Emma means. But if it's a serious what, event, it, yeah. One of the problems with this, and again, the public perception or the racing public's perception of the British Horse Racing Authority is that they're very good on uh, sticking their size tens into the small guy, and they're not anything like so effective when it comes to the bigger names in racing. I 
I suspect that Johnny Butler's been on their radar for quite some time because obviously his closeness uh, to Barney Curley. Um, was it the same uh, system of justice when uh, Mahmoud al Zaruni uh, tested, his horses tested positive for steroids? I, I seem to recall that hearing being uh, held at the convenience of Sheikh Mohammed, who was supposedly the guy in the dock. Uh, the British Horse Racing Authority also announced um, amid a fanfare of trumpets uh, the strict liability uh, cases. Of course, when it involved Philip Hobbs and Huey Morrison, and I think we agree that neither trainer did anything wrong, they had to put their strict liability uh, to one side because uh, they didn't have the, another inelegant word, balls to enforce it. So the moral of this story is they're very, very good at dispensing justice when it comes uh, to nearer the bottom of the pyramid. They're nothing like so effective when we get near the sharp end. <sighs> right. On we go. Doncaster this week, which was forced to abandon midway through Friday's card because the ground was slippery. They got through uh, Saturday, but with several withdrawals. And Emma, you were quite heavily involved and not involved in equal turn on both days. You had a winner. You took a few horses out. Were they at fault? What was the problem? I don't, I, yeah, I, I don't envy the job of a clerk of the course in the first place. But on on Wednesday evening, the ground at Doncaster was described as good, good to soft in places. Um, a declaration on Thursday for Friday's meeting, it was good. But when you know when anyone got up there on Friday, the ground was was good to firm. You know, it was it was unbelievably quick. And the problem is, is is it's just the misleading of it. It is sending. So, you know, we're sending a lot of horses up there um, wanting to run on ground that is described as good, which is kind of like it, any ground is just good at the minute. Um, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't equate to what the ground actually is. And it's a very expensive pastime to send your horses up there in the first place. And it's risky. You know, if you've got a horse that you think the ground is good and you find that it's quick, you're not going to want to do damage on it. Now, the problem at Doncaster was um, on Friday... Um, a couple of horses, in fact, Buster Thomas, who won, he slipped on that bend going away from it was the... Kind of, it, was, it was greasy with a little bit of rain or exactly, a little bit of drizzle. Or... Exactly. And, um, and then in the next race, um, Aidan Coleman's horse slipped completely and that was it. They decided to abandon racing and try and sort it out for Saturday. Um, but And they slit it, they watered the last furlong. There was some drizzle on the ground on, on Saturday, but you had an inch of, of, of sort of ground that, that was just being kicked off and then you were going back to this hard ground underneath. So for any of us that had, had declared on, on genuine good ground, it was so far removed from that that it just wasn't safe to run them. And that's why they had so many withdrawals. But no one gets compensated for that, for running, sending all your horses up there. The owners are still paying the charges. When patently, it there is isn't, liability. There, there has to be. Well, it's just not fair. Um, you know, and expecting people to to be paying for that mm. and getting no run at the end of the day. You know the deal. Where there's blame, there's a claim, right? <laughs> 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 I'm being flippant, but yeah. not flippant at the yeah. same time. It's and just it's not, not right, not and it, it, it happens too often at the moment. Especially when someone like Warren Greatrex and his owners are trousering 15 ground for being the only person to declare <laughs> in the walkover at, at Leicester today. And, of course, the ground now at Leicester is probably OK because they've had a load of rain in the Midlands. Um, do you think, Mikey, that if there are fewer than, say, four three, four declarations for a race, they should simply say, well, this is no good to anybody. We'll just get, we'll just get rid of it. Perhaps they should, especially when it's for a, a decent prize. Um, this horse today, Bela Rico, has got to be one of the luckiest horses uh, around the country at the moment, and his owners are doing really well out of it, so they won't be saying the same thing. But, um, yeah, I think maybe when it's, when it's such a valuable contest, it should be sort of shuffled around and moved elsewhere to a different day. I mean, full, mar full marks for their enterprise, Emma, for, for declaring the horse and getting all the money, but surely there's there's a better way of distributing resources than that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Leicester's in a, in a pickle, you know, with all of this. You know, they've got, you've got every bit of ground there. I mean, I know the chase track was, a, was abandoned because you got hard, but even for saying, you know, they've had the rain, you've still got good to firm, firm, good to mm. soft, soft. I mean, it is, it is, I haven't walked it, obviously, but it's dangerous ground like that. And, you know, I think if, if you're getting that amount of inconsistency on a track, 
for me, I don't think it should have been staging racing, you know, at, for, for today like that anyway. You know, that's, that's the reason they're not getting the declarations. Um, you know, I think that that needs looking into. And when we talk about pressure on racing's finances all the time, this just seems unnecessary wastage and leakage. It does. Um, I mean, I think we've we've struggled uh, with a, a problem over the last few weeks this autumn, haven't we, with small fields. You know, I, I did Kempton on Monday. I mean, we were all at Kempton yeah. on Monday where uh, we had a, a match and a three-runner race. And uh, I don't really know quite what the... The underlying problem is it behind it, whether it's the ground, whether, whether yeah. the, the number of jumpers in training has fallen, I, I don't know. Um, it's obviously today not a satisfactory situation at Leicester, but the good news is I've got the winner of the last. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, Warren Greatrix told me over the weekend that he, he was pretty sure he'd have a winner today as well. Um, <laughs> I was in a pretty lengthy conversation with Donald McCain on Twitter during the, during the week, and he was talking to me because I was saying how ridiculous it was that, um, you forgive my digression for a second, uh, that there were only two runners in one of the race, novice hurdles at Kempton. He put forward a whole raft of suggestions as to why that might be, the ground being one of them, the lack of being able to prepare during the autumn being another one of them, the disincentives for horses rated in the mid-bracket between sort of 120 and 140, so we said we'd do a bit of work on that and, 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 and deal with it, and, and a, a prize money being, being the final one of them. And that tied in neatly with the piece that David Jennings wrote in the Racing Post when he said that winning is worth more than money. This was a key finding of a survey undertaken by the Racecourse Association among members of the NTF. The survey revealed the ability to win or be placed in a race outranks prize money offer by around seven to 70 to 30 as the main motivation for trainers in deciding where to run. 70% of trainers stated the ability to win or gain a place was their primary reason for running, whilst 30% say they were motivated by prize money. Emma Lavelle, are you in the 70? Or are you in the 30? God, I just, I just don't get this. I mean, at the end of the day, prize money has to be key. But if the races aren't right, you're not going to win any prize money, so then it becomes irrelevant. But prize money, you can't... It was the most ridiculous way of, of expressing this questionnaire. You know, it can't be an either-or. You've got to have the right races, and you've got to have the prize money at the end of it when you're winning them. Mm. Um, so... It was an interesting way that the questionnaire was put, in fairness. Um, so what you're saying is this questionnaire was not rigged, but framed in such a way as to reduce the level of importance of prize money or to reduce the perception of the importance of prize money. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it was kind of, I think, you know, ranked one to five, one being that prize, you know, what's, what's an important reason for you going, it, taking your horse to the races, ranked five most important, one least important. And, and it would be, you know, one question was prize money, the next question was, um, you know, kind of races. Of course an owner wants to go to the races, a trainer wants to go to the races with a chance of winning. Therefore, you know, the, the kind of race that's on offer is going to be given a high ranking. But actually, ultimately, you know, it, you've got to be saying that prize money is important. Mm. So this is, a, this is quite a... A canny bit of work, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm, I've not thought of it in, in, in a, such a sophisticated way. That I just thought they were lying uh, in order <laughs> to give a, uh, to give a, the idea that they were noble and sporting people. I'd much rather win. It's not all about the money. It's a bit like uh, you know asking uh, men over the eighteen, uh, age of eighteen, whether they've ever bought a pornographic magazine. Yes, oh, no, not me, Gov. You know. Well, actually, uh, most people nowadays, David, probably haven't. No, they well, don't need to. You know what I mean. Yeah. So they still buy football clubs and racehorses, even though nobody ever buys them. Good. Saved by the bell in every respect. Um, for the moment, Dave and Emma, thank you very much indeed. Mikey, thank you very much. Great to see thank you. you. Um, I hope you enjoyed.